It has been said that if you wish to see far ahead in time, you must first look far back to find lessons from the past. The archiving of documents from the past and the present is an important source for architecture and design. It captures the passing of time. It is a testament to the evolution of the discipline. The following masterclasses record the individual processes of professionals and their ways of working. Hello, I am Sol Camacho. I am an architect based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And besides designing building projects, I am dedicated to a wide range of activities related to architecture, like writing, curating, educating, and promoting the value of architecture to our contemporary society. I am also the cultural director of Instituto Bardi, the institute founded in 1990 by architect Lina Bobardi and art critic and journalist Pietro Maria Bardi, headquartered in what was their lifetime residence, the iconic Casa de Vidro, which was Lina's first project. With my training and heritage from Mexico and a decade of working in Brazil, I've accumulated an understanding of the cultural institutions in Latin America and how they address our architectural past. I'm going to talk about the work done by Instituto Bardi and the challenges we face, as well as about five iconic architectural archives that I have become familiar with while investigating this subject and with whom directors I've personally exchanged ideas. These archives include Fundação Oscar Niemeyer, Casa de Lucio Costa, Instituto Burle Marx, Coleção Gregory Varshavchik, and Paulo Mendes Arroja's archive at Casa da Arquitetura in Portugal. Together, we share struggles to guarantee financial stability, to take care of the documents, to update the archival spaces, to digitize materials, to share and spread knowledge. Opportunities like this class contribute to communicating the relevance and large potential that archives have as places of memory and imagination, especially if we work together as a network. The options for preserving an architect's legacy in Brazil are few. With all its architectural richness, Brazil does not have a single architecture museum, architecture department within a museum, or a national archive dedicated to architecture although there was an attempt inside mass administration in the 1990s. Those can be compared on Latin American realities, our Museo Nacional de Arquitectura at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City, or the Museo Archivo de Arquitectura de Ecuador Quito. But in Brazil, and in most Latin American countries, archival materials are usually inherited and kept by an architect's family or office associates or donated to a public university whose architecture schools often keep a documental archive. Assuring the preservation and operation of these institutions is the most present challenge, especially in a political landscape where public policies and investment in culture and research have been consistently decreasing. In 2018, Brazil's National Museum in Rio de Janeiro home to some of the most significant pieces of historic and scientific heritage of the country, was consumed by flames in a fire that destroyed half of its collections. Concerns about the safety of architectural collections have aggravated after a recent fire in the building of the Núcleo de Pesquisa e Documentação, responsible for over 20,000 architectural documents, including photographs, models, maps, magazines, and books from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. There were no major damages reported, but social media posts revealed documents placed on the sidewalk in order to be saved. The work that has been carried out by Ufe Rejota, the university, and some of the most important federal universities in Brazil to preserve the memory and work of various architects is of enormous relevance. One of the oldest archives in Brazil dedicated to architecture and urbanism is the Laboratorio de Fotodocumentação Silvia Vasconcelos, founded in 1954 at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, which holds over 50,000 photographs. Perhaps the largest and most important collection for the history of Brazilian architecture and urbanism is that of the Faculty of Architecture of the University of Sao Paulo, FAUSP, which since 1970 runs a sector of architectural projects within its libraries, where drawings, sketches, scale models, and photographs from renowned architects are preserved and made available for research purposes. Comprised of, four, of donations, their collection amounts to over 400,000 pieces from approximately 
40 architects, including Marina Levy, Carlos Milan, Eduardo Augusto Messi de Mello, Abraão Samovic, Giancarlo Palanti, Rosa Clias, Osvaldo Bratschke, amongst a lot of other architects. Private architects deal with, private archives deal with large challenges themselves. Exceptionally, a few of the most well-known and prolific architects have a cultural foundation established to maintain their legacy, solely depending on the goodwill and interest of the families and their colleagues. I have worked at Instituto Bardi since 20, 2015, and the case of the Bardi's archive is a fascinating one. It was Lina Bobardi and Pietro Maria Bardi's last cultural project as a perpetuation of their effort to promote Brazil Brazilian culture and art. The couple founded the institute in 1990, landmarked the house, and left an endowment for its activities by selling a Goya painting. The archive systematization was less planned, and the efforts for its preservation have depended on many years of organizing and catalog. In 1993, Marcelo Ferraz led a team with the earliest efforts to organize the first publication on Lina's work which also resulted in an exhibition that traveled around the world. Since then, Instituto's archives have traveled, promoted, and participated in hundreds of exhibitions. Thanks to the preservation of its archives, Instituto Bardi has also received thousands of researchers, curators, and editors, resulting in hundreds of publications in various languages that have taken Lina's work to all the corners of the world disseminating her views on the social role of architecture, the importance of public space, and her innovative understanding of nature's relationship to our built environment. It is through the archives, documents, and letters that we're aware of Badi's earliest intentions to promote architecture and keep his pioneering curatorial and educational program alive at Maspi, where he was director for over four decades. And it is also through the care of the drawings that Instituto has found current ways to fundraise and navigate the current context by granting design brands and galleries the rights to reproduce editions of Lina's designs, which still seem extremely contemporary. In all of these exhibitions, reproductions, and publications, Instituto Bardi opens its drawers literally, to work closely with other institutions, which in turn feeds Instituto Bardi's own cultural program with the production of exhibitions, talks, courses, and books. Casa de Vidro is an active archive, but still seems underused compared to its potential as a research institution, a place of knowledge and a green oasis in the hostile urban neighborhood of Morumbi. Morumbi, the neighborhood where the house is, was introduced to the Bardis by architect Gregory Varshevchik, responsible for the design of Casa Modernista, one of the milestones of modernism in Brazil. For its inauguration in 1930, Varshevchik organized an exhibition in the house. The exhibition of a modernist house had a natural repercussion and was widely innovative in elevating architecture at the level of art. A decade later, in 1943, Brazilian architecture was launched to international recognition with the exhibition Brazil Builds at MoMA, organized by Philip Goodwin, which was decisive in consolidating the modern as a dominant aspect of architecture in Brazil. When Gregory Varshevchik died in 1972 in Sao Paulo, most of his personal and professional archives were at his house at Rua Santa Cruz, where his daughter continued to live and keeps Varshevchik's materials until, his early 90s, until the early 1980s, where his grandson, Carlos Eduardo Varshavchik, worried about the precarious conditions of the house. He decided to donate some of the materials to the architecture archives of Fausby, where he was a student. However, many materials, including photographs, documents, and drawers, and drawings, remained at the house uh, at Varshavchik's office or with other family members and were slowly but partially consolidated by the architect's grandson throughout the years. Some of the material was damaged since the house was left abandoned for years, entangled in a legal battle between the building developer that had bought the house from the Varshavchik and the conservationist from the neighborhood who petitioned to keep the house. The house finally got listed by the heritage authorities and was acquired by the Sao Paulo state government. Today, everything is safely kept at Carlos' office at the headquarters of Coleção Varshavchik, 
on Avenida Farelina here in Sao Paulo. All the materials have also been digitized and a selection of documents and drawings is available on their website. For Gregory Varshavsky's grandson, the biggest challenge is indeed one post, the one post by private archives, which depends solely on the willingness of family members through different generations. In the absence of any public support, the management of the archives rests on the private and personal efforts of Carlos, who is already foreseeing options for the future in the case that other family members are not interested or willing to ensure the preservation and dissemination of Barshavshik's legacy. He believes that a safe and honorable road could be to lend it to a museum or library so that, so that it can be professionally managed and conserved by an archival institution while maintaining it, the family ownership. But the controversy amongst the families the decision about the proper place where the collection should be kept and whether to choose a public or a private institution since the precarious conditions of most public institutions such as Faus, to which Carlos first donated for Sharpsic's materials have not been immune from neglect and may thus not be ideal. This view is very much shared by Julieta Sobral, granddaughter of Lucio Costa, the architect and urban designer and author of the Plano Piloto of Brasilia. Costa died in 1999, leaving behind thousands of letters, drawings, photographs, and documents in his apartment in Leblon in Rio de Janeiro, where he lived and worked for many years. Julieta, a graphic designer herself, and her mother, the architect Maria Elisa Costa, who has dedicated a significant part of her life in the preservations of Costa's legacy, created a methodology to organize the material using an open source platform called DSpace, developed by the uh, MIT. Eventually, 50,000 documents were digitized from the most significant drawings of Brazil, uh, modern past, to Lucio Costa's favorite canned wraps, cars notes, and travel agendas. Everything is available at Tom Jobim's Institute's website. Jobim was one of the major exponents of Bossa Nova and a close family to the Costas. To the Costas. Casa Lucio Costa is reduced to Julieta Sobral, that's how she says it, and due to the lack of resources and structure for the handling of the archive, it is not physically accessible and its activities are scarce. Although she's now preparing a book, uh, on Lucio Costa and Le Corbusier's correspondence from the 30s until Le Corbusier's death in the 60s. The creation of Casa Lucio Costa was in a sense a result of a mistrust in public institutions. The same institutions that the architect had planned, had helped plan and build together with Oscar Niemeyer, whose own foundation was mainly the result of Ana Lucia Niemeyer, also the architect's granddaughter, who worked to maintain the integrity of the collection as much as possible. Her prolific grandfather, who was over 90 years old at the time, he lived to 104, signed the creation of Fundação Oscar Niemeyer in 1998, although not entirely convinced about the institutionalization of his archives. Initially, the Fundação was based in Niemeyer's former office, a small house in the Gloria neighborhood in Rio de Janeiro. I visited in 2015, which was unfortunately not fit to accommodate the archives. After visiting the house around three years ago to inspect a water leak on the sagging roof, Ciro Pirondi, executive director of the Fundação, and whom I can luckily call my friend, wrote a somewhat desperate letter to the Brazilian president, at the time Michel Temer, who readily responded with an invitation to meet uh, in Brazil. Ciro, in a meeting in Brazil, expressed his wish to transfer Niemeyer's archive to the headquarters of the Ministry of Culture and Education in Rio de Janeiro, the MEC, a seminal building of modern architecture in Brazil. Temer agreed, but the iconic building is undergoing renovations, with the plans on hold and the current presidency of Bolsonaro, who has been recognized for its disinvestment in culture, there is no guarantee. Today, Niemeyer's archives have been transferred and temporarily stored in two rooms offered by a private university in Rio de Janeiro with no public access. A more recent example of the creation of an institution with the aim of safekeeping and disseminating the legacy of a Brazilian practitioner is Instituto Burle Marx, founded in 2019 as a non-for-profit organization. Instituto Burle Marx focuses on, focuses on the preservation and dissemination of the archives of landscape architect and artist Roberto Burle Marx, 
and Roberto Bulemarz's office, which until then had been kept by Haruyoshi Ono, his professional partner for over 30 years. Ono continued to leave their office after Bulemarz's death in 1994, in accordance with the wish expressed to his testament to keep his legacy alive. Following Ono's own death in 2017, Isabella Ono, Julio Ono, and Gustavo Leiva's landscape architects who were partners at the studio alongside Haliyoshi Ono, dedicated to create the Instituto. The office's archives were then lent to the Institute in, the words, in their words, moving from a day-to-day -day office materials to a museological collection with new accessibility and methodolog methodological policies. In 2020, the Institute began to catalog and digitize its holdings, which amount to more than 100,000 items divided into landscape architecture projects, iconographic collection, art collection, documents, and library. The materials are currently stored at the office, but the Institute is looking for sponsorships and partnerships that will allow to have its own headquarters and be able to organize the exhibitions, programming alongside archival consultation and research. According to Isabella Ono, its executive director, the Instituto hopes that providing access to the materials will enable new connections and the discover of unseen materials from Bula Marxists who played a significant role in the creation of Brazilian identity. With the current described scenario, it is quite understandable that Paulo Mendes Arrocha, Pritzker Prize winner recognized for his brutalist concrete buildings in the style of the Paulista School, such as the Brazilian Museum of Sculpture, Newby, and public lectures on the human dimension of architecture, decided in 2020 to donate his archive to Casa da Arquitetura in Matosinhos, Portugal, which raised a heated debate in Brazil. Although very differently, it reminded me of the discomfort that exists in Mexico with Barragan's archives being in Switzerland. But different to Barragan, whose heirs sold the archive, Paulo personally made the decision, fully aware of the implications, and trusting Nuno Sampaio, executive director of Casa de Arquitectura, that his professional belongings will be accessible to a wide audience, safely kept in the professionally conditioned archive, and spaces, as Nuno announced, they will be digitized, shared, and celebrated with an exhibition. With an exhibition, the future generation of students all over the world will be able to access this material as Mendes Arrocha wanted. Paulo, who sadly passed away only this past May 23rd, 2021, had historically kept all his archives, drawings, and models in his office at Instituto de Arquitetos do Brasil a heritage-listed building designed in 1946 by a group of architects led by Rino Levy in downtown Sao Paulo. The Instituto de Arquitetos do Brasil started an effort to promote a network of architecture archives seeking to strengthen the link between public and private institutions throughout the national territory. The intention is to share knowledge, encourage research, and new readings in the field of architecture through these connections. Paulo's donation of the drawings of his oeuvre, mostly in Brazil, raises trending topics to whom archives belong. In this sense, the UNESCO Memory of the World Program, to which Oscar Niemeyer's Foundation Archives are part of, reminds us that the world's documentary heritage belong to, belong to all, should be fully preserved and protected, with due recognition of cultural mores and practicalities should be permanently accessible to all without hindrance. I insist on the importance of the conservation of places that keep our memory, especially archives of architects who normally produce much more drawings, texts, sketches, models than they build. The archives are repositories of unbuilt ideas, untested materials, and construction solutions. They're a testimony of the complex process of the design and the architectural world. There are places where we find the mosaic of the inputs that are analyzed before the decision of a door, a stair, a window, a plaza, a garden, a placement of a tree. The exchange of ideas between clients, designers, engineers, colleagues, and critics from another era which nurture and inform our current way of dealing with decisions of a physical world. For a country that has historically been recognized as a place of pioneering creative awarded architects, 
a country that by the mid 20th century was a leader in cultural contemporary discussion on architecture as a discursive practice, Brazil has today a scarce local scenario with a timid production of publications and exhibitions on the subject compared to its continental size and contrasting to its massive construction of buildings and cities, consumption of materials and technologies. Proof of the importance of this archive's role in rewriting what has been called the architecture history is the possibility to revisit thoughts through their notes and drawings and reposition their ideas in a more contemporary way helping to break outdated notions and bring recognition to those architects who may have been overlooked. In the case of Lina Bobardi, although she had the opportunity to carry out some major projects as important as the Maspi building or Sesc, Pompeii and Sao Paulo, we should not neglect the fact that only 30 years after her passing, she's being internationally celebrated today. Thanks to the democratization and availability of her archive to researchers and students, which has increased the interest in her body of work and the importance of her figure in the international history of Islamic architecture. Places like Instituto Barbie and the other ones I have mentioned have the opportunity to generate authentic and reliable information, spark imagination, the physical or digital spaces of discussion, exchange of ideas, spaces of diversity, places of agreement and engagement. Thank you.